Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Before we get started, I just wanted to point out very quickly that you have a control panel available to you. So at the end of today's session, we'll be, we will be taking questions from all attendees and we'll do a Q&A. So at any time throughout the session, if you have a question you'd like to ask Rick or Wen, please make sure to use your control panel and submit your questions and we'll make sure to address them. Again, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Sarah. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Wen. I'm the CEO of uh, Smarking. Uh, we are a tech company based in San Francisco, uh, working with uh, many uh, parking professionals, parking asset owners, to help them to extract value out of their real-time parking data and um, make better business decisions based off their own data. Uh, today, we work with more than 2,000 parking sites across North America. And since the COVID-19 pandemic breakout, we've been watching the market very closely. Um, and uh, I would love to share some of the newest with everyone today. But more importantly, today we're very lucky uh, to have Rick West, one of our very um, own uh, industry leadership uh, leader uh, in the industry, thought leader in the industry, uh, with tremendous of experience building parking companies, managing uh, operating parking companies, and advising big transactions. Uh, with as I've learned over uh, north of a billion dollar worth of uh, transactions in the past two years uh, to share with us his thoughts and his observations uh, on, uh, of the market trends, um, as well as uh, Rick is very generous uh, to offer us some deep dive insights of the Millennium Garages, USA's largest underground parking infrastructure today with some uh, uh, latest data. Um, so, um, we're very excited to get started. So with that being said, Rick, I, I think still it'd be better if uh, uh, you wouldn't mind share with our audience a bit about yourself from uh, from yourself. Yeah, just a couple quick comments. Uh, one, the Millennium Garage will be a big focus today because well, um, the sparking data is always confidential. We've agreed to share our parking data for this webinar. Um, and we use, we use sparking uh, heavily there and have since the very beginning of the current ownership's purchase of the concession. But I also personally am involved with owning parking garages in other cities, so Louisville, Kentucky, Cleveland, and Nashville. So I have a perspective of what's going on in those in, in many markets, but specifically those where I have an asset. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thanks a lot. So um, uh, for today, our session is really focused on three themes. So first, we will look at a, uh, national and uh, regional trends um, with the latest uh, data. Uh, we're going to leverage the uh, newly released this market industry benchmark tool uh, to based off all the locations that we're uh, observing in real time to see what is happening on the market. And then we'll do a deep dive um, uh, for the Millennium Garages uh, to see uh, uh, how do we interpret the market trends, national and regional, um, and compare that with our own parking locations. And at last, uh, Rick would share with us uh, about his future expectation and the future of the market and some of the thoughts on what are the actions uh, parking asset owners and operators may be able to take um, to accelerate the recovery out of this pandemic. Um, as Sarah mentioned earlier, we will leave uh, time for our uh, audience to ask questions. So whenever you have a question, please feel free to type in and we'll make sure to cover it uh, at the uh, last section. So with that being said, um, Rick, I know that um, you have some of the latest data that you can share with our audience uh, in terms of what's happening at Millennium Garages, and maybe just a little bit about Millennium Garages itself. I'm sure about the garages themselves. There are four underground garages that are in very close proximity to each other. They're underneath all the parks in Chicago. Um, so they serve kind of the business district of the loop, but it also serves a lot of tourism, daily, big event, small event. Of course, a lot of these things aren't going on right now. Um, and I think one of the interesting challenges for underground garages oftentimes is, especially for people who are visitors to an area, is they don't they don't know about the garages and they don't go down there. So just in a normal circumstance, we have um, marketing uh, op opportunities and challenges to try and get those first time visitors. And right now, I think that's even more um, of, a, of an opportunity, I'll say, because one, we find once from the 
trust pilot surveys, once people do park with us and they pre-purchase a parking, they get the trust pilot survey. We get a lot of um, great comments regarding convenience and value. Um, and I think one of the great things about selling parking online in advance is you, you, an underground garage has an equal playing field to an above ground garage or a surface lot because people are looking at location and they're looking at price. And, and so once they've bought it, they've made that determination they're going to park there and then you get that reaction you get that repeat visitation so this chart um so actually a couple more bullet points pre-covid you know we had about 5500 monthly parkers and another big group that was coming in which has been interrupted because it was an, a corporate relocation to a building nearby us uh we would typically um july is our biggest month of the year because of the seasonality of all the tourist things that are going on and just the visitation to Chicago as one of the largest tourist destinations in the United States. And so this chart's been a chart that this is a smarking chart that we put together. And um, and basically this is what I've been looking at with the team more than any other chart. We look at it and distribute it um, every every Monday because it's the week ending Sunday, so seven days. And if you really look at the column on the left or the um what you really see was that's the week ending march 15th and so that was kind of still normal for us and so that in that week we parked 35,836 cars if you add up all those segments now those segments which might be a little hard to see but are basically color coding so the top one on the top purple is tr total all locations all four locations customers who pay at exit so true drive up and then the the green is total all locations of prepaid tickets which is predominantly all pre-sold online through our various channels we participate in and then you can see the red is that's just the physical number of monthly parkers who parked actually during that seven day period so over twenty one thousand. and it, and and that's a really interesting data point we'll come back to and then of course the blue is all locations credit card on file what that is for us and it's a program we're expanding now because we had previously just offered it to our big group accounts for the parkers who didn't park often enough to be a monthly so they have a credit card on file they come and go on the same credential as a monthly and it just hits their credit card for whatever the negotiated rate was uh each time each time they exit so if you if you look at the second column from the left that was really when businesses were sending people home but stay-at-home orders by the governor had not yet been issued of course the following week is when that was the first full week of the stay at home was was there you kind of very really quickly that we kind of in total adding up all those categories just hovered around a thousand cars a weekday and then less on weekends started to see a little bit of a trend you can see when you get to the fourth column from the right that's actually when the riots occurred we were fortunate in chicago um that didn't that really was not an event that lasted more than a few days so that i think it, it was mainly a week however we did get i think a lot of sentiment feedback from businesses especially large businesses that were planning on hey we're bringing employees back starting in june all of a sudden that put a big pause on things and i think what i also heard from our, some of our big clients in other cities as well as chicago was that a lot of big businesses, the biggest of the big businesses, also went out and surveyed their customers in a variety of cities and just kind of heard, hey, we're not quite ready to come back yet. And so we've, we, we certainly have seen um, th that trend occur and elongate out. So in those last three weeks, when I was last doing a, a webinar with Wynn, I said, you know, at some point I expected this sloping trend chart to go to a step that it would periodically there would be a step can't necessarily predict when the step's going to occur and you know even ignoring the riot week we, we really did kind of do a step in the week ending um june 14th so that's the third from the right and really where we are today so this last column on the right was up through sunday so just two days ago and there's a couple of interesting things i'm just going to you know point out on this so one the at the low point so if, if we were at 35,800 plus cars on the far left, when first full week of stay at home, we dropped down to 5,300 and change for cars, so down 30,500 or 85%. That was physical cars there. When you go to the last column on the right, um, you know, 16,867. So we're like the airlines, we've grown a lot, but 
we we fell so far you know we're still a long way away from where we where we used to be but that on from a physical standpoint you know that's down 52 percent versus 85 percent now remember this is a sequential week over week because that's what i was interested in tracking tied to the covid if we were looking at this as a year over year and 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 when we'll be showing some of his charts he'll pull up are more of year over year you know you would see that it wouldn't look as even as good as it is because july is our biggest volume month because of the tourism so we, we are way off you know that that peak but within the context of these bands these different types of uh transactions when you look at the purple on the on the right hand column so 66727 and then you look at the column on the left all the way over on the left, 5,835. We're actually physically parked more transient drive up cars last week than we parked in that week in March. And some of that's little seasonality, but some of that is the recovery. But some of that is also what we've been doing on the marketing side, believing that we got to get a bigger piece of what is now a smaller pie. And so we've been aggressively trying to attract new first time customers that we could return, turn into re repeat customers. And so it's actually just extremely interesting that, you know, that's 15% up over that week ending March 15th. Now looking at the green, so online prepaid, so that's actually still down 42% from the uh, pre-COVID week. But on the other hand, if you look at it in the week before the riot, so 1,038, it's up 150% from there. So the online is coming back. And it's just more that that trend is starting. And also during the heart of COVID, we turned off our marketing. And so that's also reflective of, I think, the aggregate channels that we use and our own marketing that we do. But we're seeing, and I expect that's going to continue to contribute. I think the most interesting, one of the most interesting one is the, is the red, though, the 6,576. It's just showing how slow those 5,500 monthly parkers are coming back. So there's going to be comments that I'll refer to back to this, but I wanted to give you this kind of as an orientation of the mix of business and what's been going on during COVID and how it's been changing just in the last in the last few weeks. Uh, and I'll be referenced back to I'll be referencing back some comments to this as we go on. Thanks, Wynn. Thank you, Rick. This is amazing. So it's really uh, fascinating to see that the trend that is actually doing better than before COVID, although we're comparing June with March. But as you said, 15% up, um, and it, the other categories are taking a little time, but it seems like, as you said, online is picking up the pace really quickly, um, just compared to the week before the uh, June 7th. That is amazing. So with that, with that uh, being the context here, this is what has happened in the uh, Millennium Garages. Um, we'll, we'll dive into so what is happening on a national level. Um, in terms of across the board that we're seeing at Smarking here. So um, this is our uh, um, newly launched uh, uh, industry benchmark tool, which as you can see, uh, what happened is uh, Smarking has sampled um, over here nationwide, 840 plus locations. Um, and we're gonna take a look at, uh, maybe Rick, you say transient or contract first? Yeah, you know, let's look at contract. Whichever one you pushed, we'll go with that one. Yep, and let's let's say we wanted to look at the data for up until last week. Um, let's use a different location. Just to let's say we wanted to look at the most recent weeks. And with the two, you can pretty much uh, go from uh, any, and you think a week over week cadence would be good? Sure. Okay. okay, so let's take a look at week over week nationwide. Um, let me zoom in a little bit. Just to make sure. Looks like um, before, before the COVID-19 uh, outbreak, um, the business nationwide, at least with all the locations that we're sampling, uh, we're doing better than last year, except this one week. Um, on average, uh, a lot of locations are having more activities than 2019. But then within a week, 
uh, in that particular week of March the 16th, uh, the volume went down to immediately half of last year. And then uh, within two weeks, basically, to a certain extent, we stabilized for a few weeks at just 20, 25% or 20% of last year's volume. And we touched the valley point the second week of April, it looks like. And um, observation goes that since then we have been picking up back to 30% last year by the last let me see last week of May. And then there was a bit of a hit or a, um, a stagnation or coming back in the first week of June. But seems like nationwide, in particular last week, it, there 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 is a downtrend again. Um, not sure what's happening, but this is kind of sort of a, we've been picking up for one time, two weeks before we were at 35% of, um, uh, across, the, across the board, we're at 35% of last year's um, volume. And notice this is the um, uh, contract or the monthly parkers only in terms of volume. So basically match back uh, uh, to the Millennium Garage is the uh, rat column, uh, basically only the transients, uh, only the uh, monthlies. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that I'm really interested in, and, well, this is national data and it's quite a mix of locations, so it, it doesn't, it's a good context, but it's a 20,000 foot view context. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, one of the things I think is going to be most interesting, and this was, yeah, our um, Grant Park North location. Now, Grant Park North is one of our four garages and um, it is um, uh, our busiest garage, though, from an activity standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one of the things that I'm really interested in as we get farther into this presentation and, and maybe you want to move on to, um, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's take a look at Chicago. So, um, Chicago here, we sampled 20 plus locations and I know Chicago, Chicago is a huge city. So always, obviously we wanted to sample as many as possible locations. Um, so, um, for, for this benchmark, um, tool, um, we're currently enabling free access to um, qualified locations to essentially let our partners and uh, customers to opt in, opt out. If you wanted to have access to all the other locations, you can opt in your location. If it's a qualified location, you can get free access to this. So um, our hope is with the collective efforts, we can expand the sample pool and hopefully for a city like Chicago, at least we have 100 plus or so locations in the future and we can make this data really more meaningful. But yeah, Rick, to your point, uh, it's probably more useful to look at regionally what is really happening in the local market. So looks like, um, let me know what may be interesting information for us to uh, see here and I'll just to take us there. What do you think would be uh, the, some of the most important? I mean, I just think it uh, on the contract side, it just shows the slow recovery of people com coming back into work. Definitely. Our sense of the monthly parkers that are that are coming back in our garages or the small and medium sized businesses are coming back much more quickly. We actually took a look at our four garages. So like Blue Cross Blue Shield, we park over a thousand monthlies from Blue Cross Blue Shield. They're hardly in the garages. Um, a, a big financial institution that has just been um, that is coming into our garages and the, the ones that are already there because they were doing their move in when COVID hit. You know they're hardly in our garages, and I and so I really it's just the elongation of that out. Now a couple interesting things when you think about contract parking, and I may bounce on some of these comments, but one of the things I'm really interested to look at when we get more data going forward. And by the way, I think you know the one reason you should take smarking up on their offer of if you don't use them at a location, if you're qualified location, this allows you to compare your data, so not just look at the national and regional data but actually compare your data and so i think that that becomes very useful so one of the what do i want to know about monthly parkers is not just when how the pace of their coming back is their utilization so if for example our average monthly parker parked 18 times a month um if there's like 21 point something weekdays that means there's a few days they're always not parking but these are averages as well I'm I'm not going to be surprised if all of a sudden that 18 days a month doesn't go down to 14 days a month. And I and I really want to know what is, you know, by big groups, how much are they using? Are they 
the arriving at different times of the day than they used to? Are they departing at different times? Is the length of stay that they stay in the garage? One of the big institutions we've talked to said, well, they want everyone back when they bring people back, but they're gonna do morning shift, afternoon shift. You know, it's white collar, but it's still, it, they're gonna do that. But the, and they don't want them to overlap because they want different work circles so that if the morning shift all of a sudden has a COVID issue, it doesn't affect the after, you know, the people that come in. So they'll start earlier on the first shift, they'll end later on, on, on the second shift. We know that there's another big institution we've talked to, they're gonna be A and B groups. And A group will come in one week and B group will come in the next week. There's gonna be all sorts of iterations. But fundamentally, we're so large, we don't have to worry about filling so much. But I think for a lot of garages, if your oversell factor on monthlies is 20% pre-COVID, it could be 35%. You might be able to sell more monthly parkers. And one of the things we know, and I think that chart I showed you, which don't go back to when, but of the Millennium Garages, I, one of the things we attribute some of our marketing, but, all, it, but it's the people who are on mass transit who are now driving in and don't wanna be on mass transit. And that's about one third of all commuters in the loop in Chicago. So it's a big, deep market. So the question is, is if you were having, if you were kind of at capacity limitations on monthlies pre-COVID, you need to measure that data because that's going to tell you precisely what oversell factor that you can increase to. And if it and if it changes over the next six months, you'll be able to know exactly when it's changing, which will tell you then what you should be doing. Can you just to the to transient when absolutely yeah so we saw what's happening in the contract monthly parkers world and for transient same thing um we see similar trends but the numbers could be very different so as i remember bearing in, mind, bearing in mind grant park north garage which is what he's he's got up is um it's it's entrances and exit is in the middle of michigan avenue um it is it's if from our four garages, it's the hundred percent district that always had, even you know, pre-COVID, the most transient business. Mm -hmm. And so as you as you see this, that this garage is actually out before outperforming the market. Yes. Now again, this is 20 plus locations. You know, it's anonymous data. So I know we're outperforming the market, but I can't tell, I can <laughs> I can suppose why. Um and it's important in my other garages wouldn't be showing this outperformance. Grant Park yeah. South, for example, might be showing underperformance because mm -hmm. of a big, it's just not back yet. And, and it's never been as big a transient garage being on the south uh, side of the, of, of the Art Institute. Um, but, it, but it is important. And I think one of the things on the transient we're looking at is understanding that right now, the commuters are who's coming back, not mm -hmm. the tourists. And so we're looking at our transient products, and I've said this before, but I'll ex extra emphasis. We're, we're looking at our transient products as we're expanding that daily use card where the big groups were offered the option of credit card on file for the employee and, and they pay by the, by the use. Um, and we're, so we're, we've expanded that and we're now selling that to the general public because we think a lot of people, it may take a while before they actually Often enough to want to be a monthly, so some monthlies may trade down to that. Other new customers may want to go into this um, daily use card, and and we're working with a new provider because we have not had an app for these garages. Mm -hmm. So transients will be able to actually have this program on an app, a white labeled app, and they'll mm -hmm. come out of the garage on Bluetooth without touching any gates, and therefore we also get to know who our transient customers are. And we'll be able to understand their activity patterns because we'll measure it through through smarking, mm -hmm. and and we, and that's going to be really important because that's that's the customer segment you know that we have our best chance to recover the quickest on is those people who are not on mass transit but are coming to Chicago for work. So, and and interestingly, in talking to a couple people in the transit industry, transit authorities are generally. And not every city has big transit authorities, especially oriented to fixed rail and white collar transportation. But they're not anxious for all their customers to come back, even though it's financially distressing to them. Because, and the mayors are not necessarily anxious for everyone to get back on mass transit either, because they don't want the recurrence. And they know that one of the highest risk things anyone can do in their city and coming and going from their city is to be, you know, on a train car 
which can't be socially distant if there's too many people there. So I think we were all thinking in the industry that this might be something that is a big benefit to us to the end of the year, maybe into next year. The people I'm talking to in government, it could be through through next year and even linger after that. So I think you really need to take a, you, I think we all need to take that view that this is a multi-year event and, mm -hmm. and patterns like this have to be watched because they will change, but um, so. I see. So essentially, Rick, you're saying, and what we're saying here is, Paul, on one hand, both contract and transient, we see recovery in the Chicago region. And for Grand Park North, um, on the contract side, we're kind of sort of in line, but a little bit behind. But for yeah. the transient, we're beating the market um, pretty well. So by now, the market has back to uh, well, 30 yeah, just, just that one garage, not all, not all four. Absolutely. And we can definitely compare all four together with the rest. So uh, you're, and you're saying, although this is happening, there are mega trends from how the, actually how the um, behavior of Parkers could shift from a more fixed monthly to a little more flexible transient as one thing. And from a commuter kind of sort of a pattern, there may be shift, as you mentioned, from kind of sort of public trans uh, transportation to more of can a you look at, driving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you look at the four Millennium Garages together, but look at a length of stay for transient? Absolutely. So if we look at all four garages and for length of stay, uh, what time frame do you think would be the best? Um, why, don't, why don't you just do it for um, uh, March through end of May? March to May, okay. Yeah, so just what you got up there. Last three months. Uh, this is broken down by location. These are the four garages color coded of the four locations. Right, so you know, basically, when you're mm -hmm. the people who know the million garages know this. We're, we're three point eight million square feet, so the idea of someone parking for a half an hour or something is not realistic because by the time you 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 pull your ticket and you, park and you walk to wherever it is you're going, that's a half an hour. Yeah. Um, so, but one of the things that that I'm really interested in, you know, in the one hour, two, three, four, five, and then you get to eight. And, and nine and 10, which are more the all day parkers. Yeah. Is I'm really interested to see how this comes back because transient, of course, is our most profitable car mm -hmm. in the highest, uh, rate um, mm -hmm. for monthly and things, like, mm -hmm. and things like that. Yeah. And we, um, because, because our transient demand was not only, was visitation for business. So one question I have, you know, I ask is, okay, for that, Three hour car that I used to get a lot of three hour cars from people driving in and parking and going to a business meeting. When are people going to allow other people in their offices again? Forget when the cut when the employees come back. When are they going to allow meetings with the people from the outside to come back? That's going to be mm -hmm. a different timeline. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I'm trying to understand because I our revenue composition would, for transient, which is in part length of stay driven as well as week driven. Mm -hmm. is, is um, driven by that business activity. And another activity, which we actually already see is coming back, mm -hmm. are appointments. Mm -hmm. So we are actually, we've been going out and setting up new validation accounts with Dennis and everybody else because their their clients are driving mm -hmm. and as well too, but they're open. And so we actually are seeing that. But when is, when is a major accounting firm gonna allow a, a, a client come to their office so we need to understand, I need to understand in my team, how does this historical um, duration distribution, so from like 2019, so one of the things we're doing is we're doing a deep dive data mining on 2019 by month, by day of week, by length of stay, by transaction type, because we need to overlay uh, starting probably September and after, understand which parts of businesses are coming back faster than others. So in that, transient, I said, hey, I'm parking more cars last week than I did in a particular week in March, but I need to look at it deeper and understand, but, but what day of the week, what's the length of stay, and, mm -hmm. and try and therefore understand um, what's, what's tied to major events, which will be a long time before we see that come back, what's tied to small events, um, 
So it's just typed to these different types of business activity. So, you know, because if you really look at kind of your revenue broken down as A plus B plus C plus D equals, you know, E, well, I need to get to E, which is the revenue we're generating, but I'm not going to get A and B and C and D are going to be different. I need to find the ones that are going to allow me to move better than I was, mm -hmm. figure out the marketing. Yeah. And, um, so, so these are all things you can see over on the right hand side. Um, that's a very powerful to the right of one day. So one D mm -hmm. because that's, um, we were growing a big business in the multi-day stay people mm -hmm. self -working and going to their hotels that are not necessarily too nearby. Let's mm -hmm. save a lot of money because of the, we were selling, um, two day minimum stay and three day, mm -hmm. four day packages. And so each of those cars is representative of not like 20 or like if our, if our average rate was like $22, you know, those cars over on that right hand side, their average rate is, you know, $52. And so they really um, pack a big punch in terms of the revenue contribution. It's going to be interesting to see what really happens um, in, in that segment as well, because that's tied to multi day leisure yeah. and, and business tourism. So Rick, we just turned on compared to the same time period last year, and it does look like, although the uh, we have the same peak for the nine hour, but, uh, although there's a reduction of volumes, but let's let's ignore that for one moment, which is uh, what is happening across the board right now. Looks like for all millennial garages, the the kind of sort of the full day peak is still at nine hours, and the distribution is rather similar. Although uh, last year there were more ten hours than eight, and this year it's similar. It, uh, we're compared May to May, but there's a huge change in terms of the pattern in the shorter time stays. Looks like last year, shorter time stays, we have a three hour peak in the, uh, just to, uh, in between one to four hours of stay. And this year, either majority of folks either stay for one hour and it just dropped. There's not many three hour yeah. uh, um, transa uh, transactions. How do you interpret that? Well, I'd have to look at it month by month versus we just grab, you know, March, April, May, I guess. Right. Uh, this is actually just May. So, yeah. It's just May. Okay. So, like yeah. July, July, you know, our, our transient volumes, um, I'm not going to say they double, but they're significantly higher in July. Mm -hmm. and, um, um, and that's really tied to events like Taste of Chicago, mm -hmm. which is like a restaurant week thing in the mm -hmm. park of us. Um, it wasn't uncommon for us to have hundred thousand dollar transient days and it's mm -hmm. our event of the year. Mm -hmm. And um and of course that's not gonna be here this July. So if we were looking so I would I would have to get into the seasonality of it because we have a lot of seasonality doesn't really affect commuter demand. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not it, a little bit, you know, vacation uh patterns, but um but our transient just does does skew towards what's going on in the city. Definitely. So essentially, we, we look at the market data, we look at the nationwide and Chicago. We found that although there are um, recovery for uh, on both levels, uh, for both monthly and uh, transient, when it comes to our own particular locations, for different revenue streams, we can either underperform or over uh, uh, overperform the market. Now, uh, I know we already did a little bit of this. We wanted to see, okay, then for um, um, Millennium Garages, um, what is what is happening? We already started the uh, deep diving there. I do know when it comes to our impression versus what's really happening on the market or what is really happening from a number standpoint. Uh, I remember Rick, you mentioned that there may be contributors. So I thought uh, maybe you can touch on that a bit here, just because normally we think we know what's happening, but not necessarily. If you wanted to comment on this. Yeah, so this is actually a slide that I, from a presentation I did at a, um, one of the national parking companies, um, ma annual managers conference on pricing. And so I put this slide in, he said, myth or not. And because I was speaking to operate, you know, to, uh, senior and regional and city and, and other managers. And so. You know, I would managers analyze occupancy reports before making a rate decision, and and the answer is is my experience is they usually don't. So I, I think it's a myth. Um, one of the things I would ask everyone in the room: put your hand up if you think experienced 
isn't prejudice. And everyone says, no, it's my experience. It's 100% prejudice. And because when you look at the data, it often doesn't support your, your, what your experience is telling you. And then once again, you're looking at what is the actual impact of a rate change. We're always, we're always looking at that. You know, we're a credit card world these days, and yet I still, it still shocks me that, you know, sometimes people think you're going to do every monthly parking raise has to be five and 10. You could do seven. I mean, the whole point is just every couple of dollars is all incremental profit. And then, you know, there's no requirement that posted rate on, on weekdays be the same every day. You go, it's a long time ago, but back in the 90s, uh, our rates on Fridays used to go up because of all the weekend activity of people coming in on Fridays. One of my favorite ones on this is, is that the, does lower rates stimulate new volume? And, and everyone was like, yes. I'm like, no, it doesn't. It takes market share. So that's why in, in the airline industry, in our industry, you know, if, if someone's lowering rates to take volume, it just typically leads, if, if the volume movement was too much, then there's, a, then there's a counter move from, you know, whoever lost the volume to lower rates too. And so I think we have to be much smarter on, um, you know, on how we analyze data and, and make these decisions. The last bullet point, we all know that, but back in 2011, every, it, it was difficult to convince cities that you could actually, people would just buy more parking if you gave them the option to pay by credit card. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you, Rick. So essentially you're saying, well, on one hand, a lot of uh, uh, our industry peers or community members have lots of experience and understanding of the market, especially in the pre-COVID-19 world. It is difficult to continue to rely on those intuition or as you uh, call it, prejudice to just make great decisions in this new environment in a way that um, we wanted to rely on data in a more intelligent way. I think we needed to always rely on data, but now we need to rely on it e even more. I mean, I had an experience um, back multiple years ago where I gave a bunch of data to someone and I said, you know, I want to understand frequency of use. So this was data in three cities, New York, Philly, Washington, valet locations. We had a common platform. So we had a common database. We had license plates so we could look at frequency of use. Mm -hmm. So even in a small location in like Midtown Manhattan with an, it's an elevator garage, you could go ask the manager, well, how many customers do you have that park with you regularly? Oh, a lot, a ton. Right. And then you go into the data and, and, and see, well, what does it say? And so the data miner called me because I said, I want to find out, you know, what's short term, medium term, short frequency, uh, medium frequency, high frequency. It's like, well, where do you want the cut? And I said, well, look at the data. I don't know where the cut is. Find where the cut is. He called me up the next day and he said, they need to add a, a category. He said, one time. So we were looking at three months and what we came to understand at a ton of all these locations is we just didn't understand the frequency of use. So we were, we were we had our posted rates tied to our belief that we had a lot of regular customers. And what we learned is, at least in those cities, we had our biggest customer segment was one time use in three months. So they probably didn't know what our rates were when they pulled in, and they probably didn't know what the rates were even when they paid and left. And, and so, what we learned is that we really should be pricing for the one-time user and then put our, our regular or semi-regular customers out of the programs. Now you can say, well, that's what we have um, early birds for, but I would say that that's not good enough because we also analyzed, especially in Washington, DC, where we did a, had a lot of early bird and we found out that well less than 50% of our early bird parkers at a wide variety of locations actually park more than one time in the three months. And so it, once again, we were we were giving discounts where we really didn't have to give discounts because you know the frequency of use was not what our experience thought. So I think now is the most important time. I mean, one of my things I'm trying to I need to try and figure out with my team is are our posted rates even correct anymore? And I don't that's a question. I don't know the answer. Yeah. But I feel like some portion of our posted rates are correct. Mm -hmm. But I'm if they all are I, and and i'm just yeah. you know i'm thinking about budgeting next year so yeah definitely so just to comment on that obviously earlier we saw just from a duration of state standpoint compared to uh, 
same time period last year, this May, we had much less three-hour stays. And I don't know if the poster rates at Millennial Garages or Grand Park North is it maxes out at three hours or four hours, but there's definitely a change of demand pattern. And maybe it makes sense for us to relook at the uh, um, rates, uh, as you uh, mentioned yeah, earlier. Yeah, they do, they do tend to go kind of like you know, up to three and then up to eight and up to twelve, yeah, um, and and things like that. But I, you know, I will tell you that one of the things we did with COVID is we put in emergency rates, just simplified the whole rate structure. Mm -hmm. We do that's part of the reason we've been seeing the increase in our transient business. Yeah, yeah, the rate, those rates. In fact, they're raising again on tomorrow, July first. Yeah. Um, but we're trying to use all this data and new customer acquisition, which generates therefore more data to just try and figure out what, what, what's the best model for the best yield, which of course is a combination of volume and price. So Definitely, definitely. Yeah, and just one last comment while we're still at Millennium Garages, it looks like for Grand Park North, just as one example, what we're showing here is the entry and exit uh, uh, pattern looks like compared to the same, period, uh, same, period, uh, same time period last year, where we had the peak entries, most of the people come in at eight o'clock uh, last year. Although that is still the case, but there's a local peak at 5 a.m. and there's definitely a change of pattern. So I guess this well, could that's impact. Change it. That, but that's gonna change more. There's not that many people back at work. Once right. more people come back at work in order to socially distant elevators and lobbies, they're gonna have to have people come in kind of mm -hmm. like here. You come in at eight, 8.30, nine, 9.30. Yeah. And so, um, see some sort of pattern emerge, but that's not going to happen until more people come back and they actually have to impose those kind of policies. So Makes sense. So you got to keep watching it. And um, from an exit standpoint, it looks like last year, most of the people leave at five, but the, just for this past May, it already shifted that the, the peak showed up at uh, two o'clock. Maybe, I don't know, people come in and then just leave at two, uh, but that could be the case. And I guess it really just makes sense to keep watching it and making sure that we're following. I don't know. I mean, you see people come in just to go to the office to pick up stuff and then get out of town <laughs> because they just ran out of what, picking up the mail or whatever the case may be. It's all these things. Yeah. So, so we're. Get, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say we got to get to leave some time for Q and A. Yeah, for sure. We do have a lot of questions. So I know that uh, Rick, you touched on some of these already, um, but uh, thought to ask for your um, uh, uh, sharing and insights on what do you see in the coming months and days. In terms of uh, 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 your expectation of the market and what are some of the actions you think uh, you would recommend um, to the uh, peers in the in the industry? Yeah, a couple of things. One, um, I already mentioned the A plus B plus C. It's, the revenue composition is going to change. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be an important part of our budgeting process for next year to try and get enough data this year to understand how it's changed and knowing that we're going to have to reforecast as we as we go forward but, but not just reforecast by saying to the team hey reforecast but we need to have volume and and pricing and 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 other data to help us say you know how we should be reforecasting um right now our view from forecasting that we've done into next year and the end of next year is we're looking to be back to our 2020 budget mid next year you know, all that's going to be subject to the pace of how these things occur. But I know I'm not going to, if I get back to my revenue, it's going to be in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, we have a lot of capacity so that we, you know, we, we can take on a lot more commuter parking business. Mm -hmm. In general, um, everyone's concerned about that. The Chamber of Commerce in every city and the, and the um, politicians that I talk to are afraid that if everyone gets state goes into a car, and they aren't spread out in their arrival time and departure time. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen in these cities for congestion? Mm -hmm. um, we're actually with with in Chicago, you know, meeting with some planners because Chicago is a pretty flat city. It's got a three million residential population within the city. So when you think about how many people are within two or three miles that could actually ride a bike to the loop, it's actually a lot. And they're trying to figure out well, where do the bikes go? Mm -hmm. So we're actually going to be working with them as po possibly being a bike depot, and and um, and then even how to just how I, we're just thinking about all this stuff and congestion in the elevators. I've already mentioned I think there has to be some new product, mm -hmm. including the early bird. In by X may not make sense anymore, right. um, and the budgeting is just going to be very, uh, uh, very, very, very tricky. 
and I think you know we're going, we're getting started on it now. But our start right now is just data mining, data mining, data mining to try and learn what we don't mm -hmm. oh and haven't identified yet. Mm -hmm. And and what we're doing right now because not enough people have come back mm -hmm. is just identify if we could data mine a thousand things, but what are the 25 that are going to be the ones we make decisions off of? So we're trying to do testing in our data mining, really just trying to find the 25 things when I drive our model off of. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rick. So essentially, you do expect that uh, at least for millennial garages and maybe uh, across the board that uh, what used to be the major contributor of revenue may shift, which we already observed in the recovery for uh, millennial garages when it comes to the sh shift of the uh, um, transient versus the contract, uh, as we saw in the chart. And you're saying there may be new considerations on congestion has been on the road, as well as potentially what may be some of the new things you would want it to do together with the city for the bikes and so on, that could change. And maybe there's new revenue opportunities and so on over there, but I guess you just have to try and see um, and keep watching it and keep measuring it, see what happens and so on. Um, and I think this, this, this also is a backdrop to when we talked about the garage of the future and alternative revenue. Mm -hmm. um, you know that's going to accelerate all of that. We we are, um, you know, we're building a micro data center in our garage mm -hmm. and 500 glass strand fiber. That was all pre-COVID, and it's it's in a, the construction should start some somewhat soon. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, but we know we need to diversify, anyways. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's more pressure to accelerate um, looking at those things and and moving on them. Got it. Thank you, Rick. So. We'll get into the Q&A uh, while I uh, put our contact info here and a special offer for all attendees of today's webinar from Smarking. Uh, you will have uh, free access to Smarking Industry Benchmark for qualified locations. So just contact us at the email address uh, down there. And uh, uh, for qualified locations, we can offer also a free three-month subscription for our uh, full BI package. But with that being said, the first question we have is from uh, Paul uh, Man uh, uh, Mangio. Uh, his question is, are there data sources showing parking garage used by property? Um, I guess this is referred to the industry benchmark we shared. I'll quickly comment on this, that um, today uh, we just got started with the nationwide and regional. Uh, next, the steps uh, we do, that is on our roadmap that we do plan on to segment in terms of hotel properties, office properties, shopping malls, and so on and so forth. Uh, but again, uh, to Rick's point earlier, that requires a collective efforts of all of us to essentially opt into this uh, data pool and then enable the uh, diversity of the uh, um, data sets. So short answer is yes, it's on the roadmap and uh, we can do this together. So please reach out. Second question is from J uh, Justin Donaldson. Uh, higher, is it, uh, higher trends in now versus March. How much of that is parkers who otherwise would be monthly parkers? Rick, can you, I think this is a... Uh, we, we, um... We don't think much. I mean, it, you can't, you can't, we don't know everything. So we always say there's, you know, this is, we have a lot of data, but, but not, you can't be precise. On our big group accounts, we're a thousand Blue Cross Blue Shield. We have another one that's 800. And then we have a lot of smalls and mediums. And essentially, we offered everybody, we reached out to them at the beginning of COVID and said, if you want to freeze your account, freeze your account. And if you've already paid for parking that you haven't really used, then we'll give you credits. And, and so in that regard, um, in, in, in that regard, we're, we're in close communication and, and, we, and we really think it's been more tied to our emergency rates and our marketing. Mm -hmm. We went first to a $12, any 12 hour emergency rate. We then moved that up a month ago to 1295. Mm -hmm. It's coming up to tomorrow and three garages to 1395. And then the Grant Park North garage, which is the busiest, is the, mm -hmm. is, the is going up to uh, 1495 and the 24 hour rates went up. Mm -hmm. so, um, and we also know in some anecdotal, like we had the Art Institute, we've had other clients call us who have monthly parkers and saying, hey, you know, I need a program for my people who are coming in who used to take mass transit. So, I mean, we, we know we got new people coming in too. So to our best of our judgment, it's, um, it's a, there's a lot of new in there. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So uh, once again, remember our size and diversity of demand generators. We have lots of, you know, we're in a dense, with the exception of the parks, highly densely developed um, mm -hmm. skyscraper territory with lots mm -hmm. of people. I see. So essentially you're saying, um, while there may be possibility that monthly park is converted into transit, but your focus is by uh, essentially to break it down by focus on um, offering new programs and then see what creates that demand momentum. Um, although there are cancellations or kind of sort of pause of the monthly parkers, the focus is really let, let's push out new programs and then see what gets picked up. And then just and focus on mm -hmm. Yeah, and understand that um, when we launch a program, we don't necessarily tell the world about it. We might only have a channel about it. Mm -hmm. I see. So, you can only, so if you come to our website, millenniumgratis.com, and I said, hey, we have this promotion running, you might not be able to find it because the only way you'd find it is to click on a link from this property management company to get to it or mm -hmm. to click Google ads words that we put out there and mm -hmm. not available because we're not trying to change our, we're not trying to tra trade down our current customers. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we're doing, if we're doing something specific to generate new customers, we're trying to find channels that we're speaking to new people. And like, we don't, you wouldn't, if you went into our, into our garages, you're not going to see a lot of things advertising our website because we're mainly trying to use that as a source of new people. Got so. it. So different programs for, for new people. So this actually is a segue for our next question from Cynthia, uh, a gymnast. Uh, her question is, what marketing do you do to entice newcomers? Um, I guess that is really what you touched on, but yeah, if there's more to that, Rick, please. Well, you know, we actually, um, so there's offers and then there's, and there's channels where you're executing on that offer. And, and so once again, we do a lot of pay-per-click mainly on Google, but also in others, we use outside firms that help us do that better than we would do it ourselves. Um, we found that Facebook and Facebook boosts, um, if it's a, if it's a, like we're, one of the things we're doing right now, and it's once again, we said, all right, first a thousand people, um, free parking Monday. And, and the only way to know about that is, is really through our advertising, through our, some channel partners, um, like a big property management firm that does six, seven buildings in the loop. And. And essentially, you sign up, so now we know who you are and have your contact information. You get an auto-generated barcode from us that allows you to park free up to 12 hours on Mondays, and it gives you a special rate for the other days of the week. So we're trying to use that, that to get people, especially these mass transit riders that are converting, to come and try us because we're underground again, and you know, and we get good feedback, but you got to try us. And then how many, how many, um, and then what happens to our business on the other six days of the week when they're paying. Now we're improving our technology because there's certain things that are difficult to measure. We know how many by garage of these free parking Mondays have actually physically occurred. We know how many people have signed up and, and we have other channels that we're gonna run that. And, but, but the public channel on our website, we limited it to the first um, uh, 1000. So it, so that's, and the Facebook, that's done great on Facebook, just because the nature of it being free. And, and so there's been a lot of viral aspect to that. But, uh, but it's really just finding as many channels as you can, and it's unlimited. We, you do things with you know, associations, you do things with hotels, it, it, you, you work. And you know, if you sign up five every week, well, you know, after 50 weeks, you've signed up a lot. So, and we're always trying to do things to encourage inbound, so we don't have to go knock on doors all the time and cold call. So. Thank you, Rick. A lot, a collection of uh, methods or approaches, essentially. Um, it, it sounds like a big combination of different things that you guys are doing. We, we put uh, a lot of resource, but I always have in parking because I've always found that the parking industry is not particularly good at marketing. And so if you are better and you're willing to put the resource in and, and you can identify you're getting $2 back for every dollar you spend, why wouldn't you just keep doing it and keep it could help as long keep, as just the unit is Just keep hitting singles and measure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Question from Thomas Dishman. What do you believe drove the 2020 increase over 2019? I guess this is talking about before COVID-19 in between January to March. I mean, we were up, um, in January and February combined transient numbers, we were up 9.6% over the prior January and February and March was 
behaving the same way. I, a lot of it for us was because we've been doing the marketing so hard for three years is when, as you keep doing that, you know, people get to know you and then they come back. And mm -hmm. so you I actually have an Excel model for this, which is just, um, you know, every year you lose customers because people change jobs, they relocate, they die, whatever. And so even utility companies have a, you know, kind of a 5% churn rate. Now they don't worry too much about it because when you, when you sell your house, you're selling it to someone else who's going to come in and set up an account. Mm -hmm. But we all have churn churn rates in our businesses. We it's been it's hard to measure that in 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 parking, but to the extent that you always know, like, do you measure your churn of monthly parkers? So do I need to add 50 a month because I'm going to lose 50 months just to stay even? Mm -hmm. So therefore, I really need to add 75 in order to grow. Now, when things like recession happen, which we've got going on along with COVID your churn rate spikes. So you, you then need more um, marketing wins to, to kind of uh, offset that. So it's, so it's just, but we believe we make money on our marketing. And so we we put a lot of resource, and that's people resource, as well as technology resource and direct marketing resource. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So it uh, sounds like one part of that is also, we observed a bit of a, a market uh, uptrending before the COVID-19, even across the board. Do you have some thoughts on what may have driven that? Um, I just think it's been the great economy. Mm -hmm. We really, because um, you saw that in your national benchmark, everyone was doing yeah. well. Everyone I talked to said they were doing well. Yeah. And it was that our monthly parking was growing as well as our transient parking. And um, the interesting thing is it's not events because in Chicago, we really live off outdoor events. Mm -hmm. and this January through mid-March, and there are no real outdoor events in Chicago, January to mid-March. So it was just true business activity, uh, predominantly, returning customers from all those things we've done. Thank you. Um, one comment I do have is a uh, disclaimer. So essentially, uh, although we say it's nationwide uh, benchmark, we only uh, uh, gather data from about, uh, for this uh, current uh, set of data pool, 840 plus locations, then we only know what we know. There's a lot more locations out there and there is a tendency that people who work with smart can currently opt in. Those are more of the better performing locations and to a certain extent, a little bit more forward thinking ones. And it's possible that the data set has a little bit of a bias um, when it comes to compared to 2019. These locations are doing pretty well because they're probably paying attention to measuring and managing proactively and sophisticatedly what is happening in the garage and how to adjust rates and so on. So as a disclaimer, our, our data pool is, it's more of a um, probe than it, it, it entails everything. Um, so I'll just, I'll just uh, uh, leave that comment as well. We still have a lot of questions. So what we'll make sure is we'll provide all the questions to Rick after this session and ask for Rick's input and we'll share the answers in our follow-up recap uh, um, email and blog post, and there will be a full recording of this session. Um, Rick, I wanted to thank you again for making this happen and share your insights about the national regional trends, as well as giving us the deep dive of Millennium Garages and share with us your insights on what to expect and what are some of the things to think about in the coming days to accelerate recovery. Thank you very One much. One final comment, which is just, um... So when we were, when I was a senior advisor, we were evaluating buying this concession, and we got 86 years to go on it. One of the things Wynn had just started his company, and I contacted him, and we we actually got 20 million transaction records for the prior 10 years because it had the same you know park system in there, and and working with a, a, a consultant in London, we actually evaluated those 20,000 transaction records and all the associated fields. And we actually um, correlated this set of parking assets to US GDP, gas prices, unemployment, wide variety of other things. We did it for the metropolitan Ch Chicago area and also added in tourism, jobs, because jobs and employment are different things. We, we, we correlated it to the closure of one of the garages for about a year for reno complete renovation, correlated it to the opening of a competitor garage that opened up nearby. And, you know, parking data is just very rich, and and the main 
um, investment thesis for buying the concession is it would track the GDP growth of the United States and specifically of the Chicago metro area. Mm -hmm. So we, we're talking about some very granular things, but if there are any investors on the phone and stuff, it, it's, these are great tools for actually being able to deep dive and, um, and understand, are you getting the asset you think you're getting? Um, and I think we also all understand if we're buying a new location now, we would look at it completely differently than pre-COVID because you, you'd say, well, this, this demand generator is a rock solid demand generator. And that demand generator was a convention center and now the convention center is closed. And, and so there's, there's a lot of um, second and third and fourth derivative things. And I think the data helps us understand those. So. Thank you, Rick. Um, I couldn't agree with you more that um, I believe everybody is sitting on top of a gold mine right now with your years of parking data. And Smarking is your technology partner to help you to extract those data and to turn them into something really valuable for your business. So please feel free to reach out at uh, contact or community at smarking.com or go to our website to stay uh, on top of our newest webinar sessions like this, um, as well as reach out for uh, offers for the uh, free access to the industry benchmark and the, the uh, three months pro free program for our BI uh, tool set. Um, thanks everyone again. Um, and uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we'll have a recap sending out. Uh, but yeah, uh, stay safe and well and hope your business will recover sooner than everybody else. Thank you.